so. All right, look with me to Matthew 26, verse 47. Matthew 26, starting in verse 47. The Bible says, While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword. The, the, gospels, the other gospels tell us it was Peter. Drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jump down to verse 57 with me. Those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had already assembled. But Peter followed at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome of the trial. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they didn't find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Look what it says. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard this blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spat in his face, struck him with their fists, Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Let's just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence with us and the people you love so much. Father, I pray that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen? Well, whoever said that talk is cheap, obviously never owned a cell phone. <laughs> you know that 80% of Americans now carry smartphones, and the average annual household bill for cellular service is over $1,000 a year. Talk is not cheap. Denise's family grew up in an immigrant farming community in Alberta, Canada. While we were up in Toronto visiting last month, Denise's uncle told us a story about two elderly sisters, two spinsters. They never married, but they ran a small dairy farm. They awoke one morning to discover that their only bull had died during the night. The older sister with the take charge kind of personality said, don't worry, I'll go down to the cattle exchange, I'll get us a new bull. She said to her sister, you keep the cell phone with you, and if I find a bull, I'll borrow some nice person's phone, and I'll text you to come with the truck and pick us up. $200 was all the money that the sisters had, but the take charge sister was determined. She took the bus into town, and sure enough, she found a fine young bull for $199. But when she asked the wily manager of the cattle exchange if she could borrow his cell phone to text her sister, he said, that'll be a dollar per word. She said to the manager, please, sir, I, I only have one dollar left. But he said, sorry, ma'am, that is my price, a dollar per word. Not to be deterred, she thought for a minute, and then her eyes lit up. 
She said, fine, I would like you to text the word comfortable. The manager said, comfortable? How in the world will your sister know what that means? She said, young man, here is your dollar. Please text comfortable. Sure enough, about an hour later, the truck pulled up. After the bull was loaded, the, the take charge sister noted that the manager was scratching his head and wondering how that possibly worked. And she looked him in the eye and she said, my sister is a very slow reader. She said, I knew she would get the message when she sounded out the word comfortable. <laughs> that, that was worthy of Joel Osteen right there, that joke. <laughs> you know, as Americans, there are few things that we prize more than our right to free speech. In fact, that's the, the very first right that our Constitution explicitly guarantees us in the Bill of Rights. The right to voice our opinion. The right to express our discontentment. The right to criticize leadership. The, the right to protest. The right to testify. The right to speak in our own defense. And in more recent times, social media has only heightened our sense of entitlement to free speech. We can say whatever we want, whenever we want, and within seconds, we can make our voice heard around the world. If we're feeling really pumped about something, if we're feeling bummed about something, if we're feeling hurt, if we're feeling offended, with just a click, we can send out a Facebook post or we can send out a tweet and we can let the whole world know how we feel. It is our right. But on Good Friday, free speech was a right that Jesus did not exercise. Jesus surrendered his right to speak in his own defense. He surrendered his right to explain himself, to justify himself. He, he surrendered his right to file a countersuit and to levy countercharges against his oppressors. He, he surrendered his right to vindicate himself. Through the long night and into the early morning hours, Jesus stood trial on Good Friday in silent love. Before the high priest in Sanhedrin, before Herod, before Pontius Pilate, Jesus stood in silent love. 700 years earlier, Isaiah prophesied about the events of Good Friday in detail. Isaiah wrote, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. During this season of Lent, we've been looking at the consecutive days of the Passion Week. More is written about the Passion Week in the Gospels than any other week of Jesus' life. A third to a half of every Gospel is devoted to just this one week out of Jesus' 33 years. Passion Week is, is full of lessons for us. How Jesus spent the days of the Passion Week are, are an example for how we ought to spend every week that God gives us. Even though today is Palm Sunday on the calendar, we actually talked about Palm Sunday five weeks ago. It took me a long time to explain that to my wife. But why aren't we talking about Palm Sunday on Palm Sunday? Well, we started Passion Week five weeks ago. Five weeks ago. Jesus spent his Palm Sunday determined to complete God's mission for his life. He spent Holy Monday investing in God's house. We talked about it. He spent Holy Tuesday, called the longest day of his life, in the temple contending for the souls of the very ones who would hand him over to be crucified. As we looked at that day, we saw Jesus wasn't there to win arguments in the temple. He was there to win hearts. And after his resurrection, many did believe on him. Holy Wednesday is called the silent day. 
Jesus spent it in the suburb of Bethany, enjoying the company of his friends and the closest ones to him. Uh, Pastor Nick talked to us last week about Holy Thursday. Jesus loved his friends to the fullest extent, and he performed for them an unprecedented act of humble servant service, even for Judas, his betrayer. All of these things are examples for us. I want to talk this morning with you about Good Friday. One of the lessons that we learn from Jesus about Good Friday is that there is a time to be silent. That there is a time not to exercise our, our so-called right to free speech. There's a time not to explain ourselves. That there's a time not to strive to defend ourselves or vindicate ourselves. That there's a time to surrender our wills and to simply rest in the love of God for us. Looking at the trials of Jesus on Good Friday, I see three keys to resting in the silent love of God. And I want to share them with you quickly on this Palm Sunday morning. Three keys to resting in the silent love of God. The first key is this. Silent love is rooted in our God-given identity. Silent love is rooted in our God-given identity. 700 years before Good Friday... Isaiah prophesied three times that Messiah would not open his mouth. He, he wrote in Isaiah 53 verse 7, he did not open his mouth. He was silent. He did not open his mouth. Uh, on the long night of trials on Good Friday, the Gospels record specifically three times that Jesus was silent. Before Caiaphas and Sanhedrin, Matthew says, Jesus remained silent. Before Herod, Luke says, Jesus gave him no answer. Before Pilate, Matthew and Mark say, Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge. And so the prophecy of Isaiah 53 verse 7 was filled precisely on the early morning hours of Good Friday. He was silent, he was silent, he was silent. But, but what I find interesting, look at me and listen to this. What I find interesting is that Jesus was not silent for every question. When accusations were made against Jesus, he was silent every time. But when Jesus was asked to identify himself, he answered every time. When the contingent of temple, temple guards and Roman soldiers showed up in the garden looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus answered, I am he. Do you know his name from eternity past is I am. And when the words I am left the lips of Jesus in the garden, it was so powerful that John records that the entire contingent of soldiers and guards fell over backwards. They were slain in the spirit. Jesus and the disciples could have run away, but Jesus waited for them to get back up on their feet again so they could go about the business of arresting him. After the Sanhedrin couldn't get any two of their paid false witnesses to present corrupt, these guys were getting paid to present testimony that was false and they couldn't even get their stories straight. Finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, lost his cool and he screamed at Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, tell us, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Jesus didn't answer, I am, this time. He learned his lesson. He didn't want to knock the whole Sanhedrin over too. He didn't have time for that. Instead, Jesus answered, yes, it is as you say. That was a very Jewish way of answering and what it means is, you already know. Jesus answered Judas with those very same words in the upper room. When Jesus announced at the Last Supper, one of you will betray me, Judas asked, Lord, is it I? And Jesus answered him with those very words, it is as you say. In other words, you already know, Judas. When Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, yes, it is as you say. In other words, you already know. 
So listen, listen, listen. I want you to listen to this. Listen, I catch this. Jesus abstained from defending himself, but he consistently identified himself. I am Jesus of Nazareth. I am the Messiah, the Son of God. I am the King of the Jews. And I believe that therein lies the first secret to Jesus' silent love. The reason that Jesus was free not to speak. The reason that Jesus was free not to defend himself on Good Friday is that he knew who he was. Or maybe we should say he knew whose he was. Jesus' silent love was rooted in his sense of sonship. In the upper room, John says that the reason Jesus was able to get up and wash feet, a slave's job, is because Jesus knew that God was his father. He knew that he had come from God. He knew that he was going back to God. He knew that God had given him all authority. So Jesus didn't have to worry about lowering himself to do a dirty job. He didn't have to worry about his reputation. He didn't have to worry about losing status or losing his position because he was secure in his God-given identity. In the garden, Peter rose up to defend Jesus with a sword, and Peter made a mess. Jesus said, put away your sword, Peter. If I asked my father, he would dispatch 12 legions of angels to my command. Now, a Roman legion was 6,000 soldiers. So Jesus told Peter, you don't need the sword. If I asked my father, he would send 12 legions. He would send 72,000 angels, 6,000 for each one of us, the 11 disciples plus Jesus. Two angels destroyed entirely the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. One angel killed 70,000 residents of Jerusalem when David sinned. One angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in the middle of the night when Hezekiah was king. How much damage do you suppose 72,000 angels could do? And Jesus was secure in the loving knowledge that if he asked his father, his father would exhaust every resource in heaven in order to rescue and protect and to provide for his son. When the company of 200 Roman soldiers mocked Jesus, everything they did was an assault on his identity. That they put a red Roman robe on him. It was the robe of a military commander. But Jesus is really the Prince of Peace. They pressed a crown of thorns on his brow. But Jesus' real crown is an everlasting crown of glory. They put a scepter in his hand. And then they beat him on the head with it. But Jesus went about doing good and healing people and, and acts of compassion, helping those in need. Their game was called king for a day, but Jesus has received from his father an everlasting kingdom that will never fade away. Everything they did was an assault against his true identity. Yet through it all, Jesus maintained his sense of God-given identity. He told Pilate, you have no authority over me except what my father has given to you. Can I tell you that no other experience in my life has helped me understand the love of God for me like being a dad? This is my son, Ben. He was here. We, I want to thank everyone, everyone who came all through the week last week and everyone who came yesterday to help clean. It was, it was really just an amazing, joyful time. And so my son was here yesterday afternoon vacuuming. And when I walked in and saw him with the vacuum, I completely understood when the Father spoke from heaven over Jesus and said, this is my son. I'm pleased with him. 
because that's how I feel about my kids. I have to tell you the truth. This is, this is honestly the truth. I dropped my kids off at school two or three weeks ago, and after I dropped them off, I pulled over on the side of the road, and I sat and I wept for a minute, and I thanked God for giving me such neat kids. Does it mean that, that they always do everything right? It doesn't mean I'm always pleased with what they do. But, but I would do anything I could for my kids. I, I don't have very much power. But if any of my kids were sick, if any of my kids were in trouble, if any of my kids were in need, Denise and I would exhaust every resource we have in order to help them. And if that's the case, being imperfect earthly parents, how much more will our Father in heaven come to our aid, come to our defense when we need him? How much more will your father dispatch a lead? Forget the guardian angel. How about just ask for a legion, ask for 6,000. How much more will he dispatch the beautiful Holy Spirit to come and to comfort you and to strengthen you inside and to guide you? How much more will he give us daily bread and clothes to wear and whatever it is we need? Paul writes, he who, who didn't spare his own son but offered him up for us, how will he not together with Jesus give us whatever it is we need? So just like Jesus... We can rest in the Father's silent love. Everybody look at me. Look at me, please, and hear your pastor this morning. We don't have to rise up and answer every accusation that's made against us. We don't have to answer every slanderous charge that is brought against us. We don't have to justify ourselves to everyone or fight tooth and nail to defend our reputation. We can be free not to speak secure in the Father's love for us. That's not very American, but it is very kingdom. The trials of Jesus... Three keys to resting in the silent love of God. Number one, silent love is rooted in our God-given identity. Second, silent love is fueled by our trust in God's sovereignty. Silent love is fueled by our trust in God's sovereignty. When the guards and soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the garden, Jesus said, put away your sword, Peter. If I asked my father, he would send 12 legions of angels. But listen... Listen to what Jesus said. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Therein lies the second key to Jesus' silent love. Jesus was silent because he understood that God had a plan. That word must is called a divine imperative in the Gospels. It means God has predetermined it must happen this way. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required that one of his own betray him. Psalm 41 verse 9. Yes, my own familiar friend, the one I trusted, the one who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required that he be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11 verse 12. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required that all of his disciples abandon him. Zechariah 13 verse 7. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required a sham trial full of false accusations and witnesses. Psalm 35, 11, false witnesses rise up against me. They charge me with things that I did not do. The Sanhedrin trial in the middle of the night on Good Friday was illegal in seven different ways. Capital trials could not be held at night, but Jesus' trial was. They could not be held in a home, but Jesus' trial was held in Caiaphas' home. They could not be held in a single day. They had to last at least two days, but Jesus was held in about six hours. Capital trials could not be started on a holy feast day. It was already Passover. 
Capital trials could not open with the testimony of witnesses for the prosecution and at least two witnesses had to present corroborating testimony. They couldn't even get that right. Capital charges couldn't be brought against someone who had not blasphemed the name of God specifically and no one before had anyone ever been sentenced to death for claiming to be the Messiah. They thought that such people were delusional, not criminal. But Jesus was silent through the whole thing because he knew that it was all in God's plan for him. Jesus was silent. Listen to this. Listen, listen. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required him to be silent. As a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Herod was Curious, he was delighted to see Jesus. He had lots of questions. He, he plied Jesus with lots of questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. It was more important for Jesus to stay silent and satisfy God's righteousness than to speak and satisfy Herod's carnal curiosity. That's good right there. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required derision and physical abuse. He was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required being rejected by his own people and turned over to the godless Romans. He was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required a Roman scourging, grotesque disfigurement, and the disgrace of public nakedness. Isaiah said, we hid our faces from him. Jesus was silent because he understood that God's plan for him required conviction as an insurrectionist and condemnation to death by crucifixion along with other insurrectionists. Isaiah 53, he was regarded as a transgressor, though he had done no violence. Beloved Jesus, look at me. Jesus was free not to speak because Jesus understood that everything happening to him was all in God's plan. God had a unique plan for Jesus, and God has a unique plan for each one of us. God has a plan to mold us into the image of Christ. God has a plan to prepare us to go live with him forever in heaven. God has a plan to use us here on earth for his glory And to use us to lead others to him. And I really don't know what's in your specific plan. I don't even know what's in my plan. But I do know this. Part of God's plan for both you and I includes suffering. God's plan for us includes hardships. It includes situations that test our faith. It includes, the Bible says, fiery trials. I looked that up. You know what it means? Fiery trials. (laughs) God's plan for us includes persecution in some form or another. I really wish it wasn't so. But Jesus told us. He said, I've told you these things. I I told you to expect it so that, that when it happens, your faith won't be rattled. To his beloved son in the faith, Timothy, Paul wrote, everyone who wants to live godly, in Christ Jesus will suffer. To the suffering Christians in Philippi, he wrote, it has been granted to us not only to believe on Jesus, but also to suffer for him. To the Thessalonians who who were suffering terrible persecution, Paul wrote, when I was with you, I told you we would be persecuted, and it turned out just that way. Paul, what a wise guy. He's saying, I told you so. Beloved, when you are suffering, rest in God's silent love, just like Jesus, knowing that it is all part of his custom-crafted plan just for you. Jesus said false accusations are in God's plan for you. Being willfully misunderstood and purposely misrepresented is in God's plan for you. Insider traitors are in God's plan for you. 
people who stay up all night trying to figure out how to entrap you and how to dispose of you, being presumed guilty with no hope of being found innocent, being hung out to dry by people who could have intervened and helped you. Listen to this one. Condemnation from religious people who follow the letter of the law when it suits their purpose, but who totally violate the spirit of the law is in God's plan for you. Jesus said, everybody look at me. Everybody, please. Jesus said there's a cross in God's plan for you. It's one you must bear daily. The world's philosophy is free speech. Express yourself. But Jesus said deny yourself and take up your cross. His cross requires us to surrender our dignity requires us to surrender our personal pride. It requires us to surrender our fiery fighting spirit. When trials come your way, you can be free not to speak like Jesus when you remember that it is all in God's plan for you. All right, how many of you ready for it to get better? Because, you know, the gospel always gets better, and it's about to get better. Three keys for resting in God's silent love. Silent love is rooted in our God-given identity. Silent love is fueled by our trust in God's sovereignty. Everybody listen to me. Silent love, third, endures because of God's promise of ultimate victory. How did Jesus silently endure the injustices committed against him? How did he endure the religious hypocrisy of the Sanhedrin? How did he endure the political maneuvering and compromise of Pilate? The book of Hebrews tells us how. Look at Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself who endured the cross despising the shame how did he do it because of the joy that was set before him and that's the third key to Jesus silent love Jesus knew that the story didn't end in a grave on at sundown on good friday Jesus knew that on the third day God would raise him up from the dead the resurrection was God's very public vindication of Jesus. Mankind weighed him. Mankind judged him and deemed him worthy of the most ignominious death that they could inflict. But God overturned the verdict. Peter said, you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. Paul said, he was proved to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. How did Jesus do it? It's because Jesus knew that after the cross, his Father would give him a crown. Jesus knew that after the cross, he would receive from his Father a kingdom that can never be shaken and never taken away. Jesus knew that after the cross, God would give him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. In a fit of religious rage. I read something this last week. There's nobody meaner than theologians. Boy, is that true. In a fit of religious rage, Caiaphas screamed at Jesus, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and you will see him coming in the clouds of glory. When we're going through trials... We can be free not to speak just like Jesus because we know that our story doesn't end here. Our story doesn't end with us rotting away. It ends with resurrection. 
Our story doesn't end in a grave. It ends on a throne wearing a crown of life that he's given us. Our story doesn't end in humiliation. It ends in exaltation and that from God. Our story doesn't end in disgrace. It ends in amazing grace. Our story doesn't end in vilification. It ends in vindication. Our story doesn't end in ignominy. It ends in victory. Job said, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We can be free not to speak like Jesus, because we know that in the end, we're coming out winners. Three keys to the silent love of God. Silent love is rooted in our God-given identity. It's fueled by our trust in his sovereignty. It endures because of his promises of victory. I, I want to share two closing thoughts quickly about the silent love of Jesus. And we're done. Two thoughts about the silent love of Jesus. The first thought is this. Jesus' silent love was for a unique redemptive purpose. There are, are many lessons we can draw from Passion Week. But we must never forget that throughout the entire week, Jesus was accomplishing something that only he could do. That there are many ways that, that we can and we should follow Jesus' example through Passion Week, but, but we must never forget that only Jesus could lay down his life as a ransom for the sins of many. <clears throat> Jesus' silence was unique in, in that it was absolutely necessary in order for him to go to the cross that only he could bear. We, we can't duplicate that. We, we can't follow Jesus in that. Pilate tried seven different ways to exonerate Jesus. I wish I had time to go through that trial with you. Next year, we'll do it during Lent. We'll go through the trial with Pilate. Seven different ways. But when Jesus refused to mount a defense, Pilate was pretty much forced into issuing a conviction. As a last ditch effort to spare Jesus, Pilate offered to honor an old Jewish Passover tradition. The, the Jews had a tradition at Passover going way back where they would release one prisoner during Passover. And in, listen, 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 in the place of that one prisoner, a Passover lamb had to be sacrificed to secure that prisoner's pardon. As a last ditch effort, Pilate offered the crowd the choice between Jesus called the Christ and Jesus Barabbas. The name Barabbas interestingly means son of the father. It was a popular nickname among rabbinic families and it's very likely that Barabbas' father was a well-known rabbi. But Barabbas was what we would call today a terrorist. He was part of a gang of guerrilla fighters trying to overthrow the Roman powers and that would attack the elite Jewish families that supported Roman rule. He was a violent insurrectionist who murdered people. But Barabbas was a bit of a folk hero. He was a little bit like Zorro. He was a little bit like Robin Hood, you know, steal from the rich and help the poor people, the common people. After Jesus was mocked by the soldiers and scourged almost to death, Pilate, as a, as a last-ditch effort, presented Jesus as an object of pity. Bleeding, grotesque, disfigured, naked, Pilate put Jesus in front of the crowd and he said, Behold the man! He, he suffered enough. This gentle teacher, this compassionate healer, he's been through enough. But to Pilate's dismay, the crowd cried, Give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. They rejected Jesus bar Joseph. Jesus, the son of Joseph, called the Messiah. And they asked for Jesus Barabbas. It's no coincidence. Listen, listen. It's no coincidence that there were three crosses that were ready to go on Good Friday morning. They were already prepared for an execution. 
Barabbas was scheduled to be executed along with two of his fellow gang members. The two men who were crucified on either side of Jesus, they were not petty thieves. The, the English translation gives us that, that uh, idea, but, but they were insurrectionists like Barabbas and they were part of Barabbas' gang. But at the last minute, the prisoner called Barabbas was set free and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world was sacrificed in his place. Beloved, listen to me. The 40-pound crossbeam that Jesus carried up Golgotha, it was Barabbas' crossbeam. The nails that went into his hands and his feet, that they, they were meant for Barabbas' hands and feet. The, the, the death squad of four that led him up the hill, it, it was the death squad that was supposed to be assigned to Barabbas. The pole in the center on the crucifixion hill was meant to be Barabbas' pole. And here's the truth. The truth is, we are all Barabbas. We are all sons and daughters of the Father who have fallen into the disgrace of sin. We are all worthy of death, for the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The 40-pound cross beam that Jesus carried up the hill. It was my cross beam. It was your cross beam. The nails were my nails. They were your nails. The death squad. It was my death squad. It was your death squad. The pole erected in the center position. It was designated for me to die on. It was designated for you to die on. But the Passover lamb of God was sacrificed there instead so that we could receive a pardon. Would you savor that thought this Holy Week? Read the scriptures of the Passion again. Open your Bible and read this week about Palm Sunday. In fact, maybe a good thing, a devotional this week. Start, start in Matthew with, with Palm Sunday and read. Read through each day. Read Holy Monday. Read Holy Tuesday. Read Holy Wednesday. Holy Thursday. Read about his agony in the garden. Read about his silent love on trial. Read about his suffering on the cross and savor that thought. I am Barabbas. He carried my cross. Two closing thoughts about Jesus' silent love and we're done. His love was for a unique redemptive purpose. And finally, Jesus' silent love also serves a universal discipleship lesson. Peter tells us that when we're suffering, there's a time to be silent like Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he writes this to us. It is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ Jesus suffered for you. Listen to these words of Peter, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was in his mouth. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to God who judges justly. Beloved, everybody look at me. Jesus is our example in suffering. There are times when we need to surrender our right to free speech to God. There are times when we need to be free not to speak like Jesus. As we enter this holy week, I want to ask you to do something with me. I want to ask you to join with me in first celebrating and then emulating the silent love of God. My prayer is that we would together make this week a week 
of holy silence. Good Friday is going to be a holy night in our new sanctuary. We're going to be preaching the gospel and we're going to be giving people an opportunity to respond and to believe on Jesus. And so let's observe holy silence this week so, so that we don't say anything that, that would grieve the precious Holy Spirit and thwart what it is he wants to do on Good Friday evening. Next Easter Sunday morning is going to be a whole, come at 9 and 11, don't come at 10, 9 or 11, 9 or 11, 9 or 11, but it's going to be a holy morning. Our, our first services in our new sanctuary. The things that frustrate us, the things that trouble us, the things that hurt us, the things that offend us, let's bear them silently before the Lord. Let's rest in his love. Let's trust in his sovereignty. Let's hope in his promises. And let's make this a truly holy week and a truly good Friday.